of John this morning, the book of John, chapter number 19, John, chapter number 19. We're going to be speaking on the robe uh, this morning, the robe. Sandy uh, song, very good, uh, and thank you for that. She was talking about Simeon and a Bible story there. Well, here's, uh, that's not maybe well, well known, uh, and just a little blurb. Well, here's just a little blurb in the scriptures about the robe of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, many of you know the story, but we're going to get into it this morning and speak about the robe of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before we read the scripture, let me remind you that all of the Bible is interesting. Even though you may get bogged down in a few places and wonder about some of those things, let me tell you something, it's really every part of the Bible is very interesting, and every word, every word in the Scripture has been placed there for a reason by God. Sometimes we read through the book of Leviticus, you know, if somebody's reading through the Scriptures, they say, well, I'm going to start in Genesis. By the time they get to Exodus chapter 21, they start, they start to get bogged down a little bit. Uh, they start reading about all those things that uh, the Jews uh, couldn't eat. All those crispy critters, uh, like the mouse and the weasel and uh, some of those kind of things. And they start thinking about those that they could eat, like the grasshopper and some of those kind of things. I'll pass on that, though. Uh, uh, but uh, you get bogged down a little bit. Sometimes we read the genealogies, and we wonder, what in the world is all those genealogies in there for? Well, let me tell you something. They have great, uh, great uh, learning in, in even all of those things. When it comes to this part of the Bible, which we're talking about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, every word is vital. Here, even the topic of the seamless robe, which was taken from the body of the Lord Jesus Christ before His crucifixion, and then is gambled for, cast lots for by the soldiers, is placed there for a reason. In Matthew chapter 19, I mean John chapter 19, John chapter 19, verse 23, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took His garments, made four parts to every soldier apart, and also His coat, or His robe. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, let us not rend this or tear it, but let's cast lots for it or gamble for it, whose it shall be, that the scriptures might be fulfilled which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture did they cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Now the main reason of course that this happened was just to again fulfill prophecy. To show that something that had been prophesied hundreds of years before this was now going to take place. Simeon had gotten that prophecy that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ or the Messiah. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened to him. Anything that God says is going to happen, you can mark it down as going to happen. And this was prophesied, of course, many, many years it's interesting that there's many things that's done uh, at the crucifixion of Christ, done by unsaved men that did not even realize that they were fulfilling prophecy and that the acts that they did were actually had spiritual meaning. You see, God even makes the wrath of man or men to praise Him. They crucified Jesus and fulfilled over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament. Again, most of those prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus died on the cross. Let me just remind you of a few. Y'all ready? This is in fast order. Can y'all listen fast? I'm going to go as fast as I can here to tell you. All the prophecies that were talked about, that uh, were uh, prophesied in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New Testament. His betrayal, Psalms 41, 9. Being sold for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11, 12. Money to be thrown in God's house, Zechariah 11, 13. Forsaken by the disciples, Zechariah 13, 7. Accused by false witnesses, Psalm 35, 11. Dumb uh, or silent before his accusers, Isaiah 53, 7. Wounded and bruised, Isaiah 53, 5. Smitten and spit upon, Isaiah 50 and verse 6. Mocked. Psalm 22, verse 7 and 8. 
that he would fall under his cross, Psalm 109, 24, and 25, that his hands and feet would be pierced, Psalm 22, 16. He would be crucified with thieves, Isaiah 53, 12. He made, he, was, he made intercession for his persecutors, Isaiah 53, 12. He was hated without a call, Psalm 69, 4. People shaking their heads, uh, Psalm 109, 25. Their, his garments being parted and lots cast, Psalm 22, 18. That he would suffer thirst, Psalm 69, 21. That he would drink gall or have gall and vinegar offered him, Psalm 69, 21. He would be forsaken and he would cry out, Psalm 22, 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? His bones not being broken, Psalm 34, 20. His side being pierced, Zechariah 12, 10. There would be darkness over the land, Amos 8, 9. He would be buried in a rich man's tomb, Isaiah 53, 9. Those were all the prophecies, uh, or some of the prophecies that were fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ there around the crucifixion time. His clothes were stripped off of him. The parting of his garments among the soldiers, the casting of the lots for the seamless robe was important to God and should be important to us. It is important to God because he prophesied it hundreds of years before. It is important to God or he would not have recorded it in the midst of the most meaningful passage in the gospel. If you look through Scripture, you'll realize how important garments are and the spiritual meaning that garments are, especially in the relation to salvation. Who made the first clothes? Who made the first garments? Well, it wasn't fruit of the loom. It wasn't Hanes. Uh, it uh, wasn't some of the uh, uh, name brand designers. No, it was Adam and Eve made the first clothes. What did they make? They sewed some fig leaves together and covered themselves after they had sinned. Now, Adam and Eve tried to cover their nakedness with those fig leaves, but that was not God's way. And it is a, it is a symbol of how people try to cover their wickedness up today. They try to cover it with some fig leaves and, and try to hide their wickedness from the face of God, and guess what? It did not occur. God still saw their wickedness. So God came along, and He, in loving mercy, killed two animals and took their skins to make clothes for Adam and Eve. So when we start talking about clothes, we go all the way back, of course, to the Garden of Eden. And, and the first set of clothes that was made. Now, since that time, unless you're a nudist, I guess, clothes have been worn. Now, there may be a few tribes in some of the woods, uh, uh, in, in some of the back jungles uh, in places. Uh, some of you have seen those on National Geographic before. Uh, you say, boy, they, they're not wearing any clothes. But for the most part, people wear clothes. And you know what our clothes are? It's just a confession of our sinful nature. That's all it is. Why do we have to wear clothes? Adam and Eve were naked. We're not ashamed, but they, after they sinned. They were. They were. We should be decent in our clothing. We should be modest in our clothing. We should try to cover up. Too many people are trying to uncover in our world today. We need to try to cover up. And I'm going to tell you, indecent and immodest dress shows a lack of respect for God. And you say, boy, we sure got a lot of that in our world today. Yes, we do. Now, that's not the, my message today, but I thought I'd throw that in. That's free. It doesn't cost you a thing. Back to the seamless robe of the Lord Jesus Christ. This seamless robe that Jesus wore was a unique, perfect garment. And you know what it symbolized? It symbolized a sinless man. This seamless robe was a perfect garment and it symbolized or pictured a sinless man. There was nothing sewed together, which was very rare indeed. And even today, the clothes that you have on today has been sewed together. Now, there, there are still seamless things in our world today, but they're few and far in between. Most of what you wear, most of what you buy have been sewn together, have seams in them. There was, Jesus' garment was not patched, 
uh, 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 it needed no adjusting, it needed no correcting, it was perfect. And again, it symbolized the Lord Jesus Christ, the sinless man, this one who was without fault, the one who was without stain. And, and the garment that pictures him was woven without a seam. You see, even the best human righteousness today is patched and mended. All of us are sinners. Hey, or, or, or could we consider ourselves good people? Yes, for the most part. I, I look out here, I say, i got a bunch of good people looking at me. But we're still all sinners. We're still all sinners. And there's times that we mess up and we have to kind of, uh, 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 we've torn our garment a little bit and we've got to kind of patch it and mend it. We've torn a relationship and we've got to patch it or mend it. We've said something we shouldn't have said and we've got to patch it or mend it. Not so with the Lord Jesus Christ. We try to do right consistently, but we fail many times. We have to, you know, we say, well, I'm going to change. I'm going to make a new resolution. And then it don't take long to, to have to make another resolution be, uh, to make up for that resolution. Matter of fact, the, the easiest part of a diet is the second day. You know why it's the easiest part? Because that's the day we quit <laughs> our diet. It's too hard. And then we have to make a new resolution. And we say, well, I'm going on a diet. Or I'm going to change in this way. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to do something. Jesus lived a sinless life. It was Pilate who said, I find no fault in him. The thief on the cross said, this man has done nothing amiss. And I'm going to tell you this morning, listen to me, only a blasphemer can find fault with the Lord Jesus Christ. Only a blasphemer. One day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus has heavenly garments on today that picture his heavenly glory. His deity. The seamless robe on earth pictured his perfect sinless humanity. And, and, and for that, the soldiers cast lots. And one of them, one of them, got to take it home with him. Think about this. Jesus took off or allowed them to take his seamless robe offered him, uh, off of him so that we, again, symbolically, might put it on. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life of his own accord. No one took it from him. Pilate didn't take it from him. The soldiers had no authority over him except that which he gave them. And so they could not have taken his clothes and cast lots for that seamless garment if God and God the Father and God the Son had not allowed it to happen. And why did they allow that to happen? So that he could die on that cross for us. He took off his robe, his seamless robe, picturing his perfect, perfect righteousness in order that we could put it on. He became sin for us. The Bible says he who knew no sin became sin for us and died for us. He had to take that seamless, seamless robe off, which symbolized his sinlessness, and, and give it up for us. We know that even God the Father, as we mentioned earlier, turned his back on him. Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus suffered the torments and loneliness you and I justly deserve. Jesus, as the Bible tells us, was brought as a sheep before the shearers, stripped of his garments. But listen, just as a sheep, he made no protest. The crowd looked at him, mocked him. They said, Well, he saved others. Himself, he cannot save. Well, he was not intent on saving himself. Why? So that he could save us so that he could save us, to take our place. Now, think about Jesus and his garments. You know, this was not the first time that Jesus had taken off his garments. If you, if you stop and think about it, when he left heaven's glory, he left the garments of heaven there, the outward manifestations of his deity, and took upon himself our kind of garments, except the seamless robe again uh, symbolizing his uh, purity and his righteousness. His sinlessness. The Bible says in, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, He made Himself of no reputation, and took upon Him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We also know there was another time Jesus took off a garment. Do you remember the night before He was to be crucified? The Bible tells us that He, he took off His garment, and He went around to all the disciples and did what? 
he washed their feet, wiped their feet with his garments. Again, symbolizing humility and having a servant's heart. And then here at the cross, here at the cross, he laid aside the same garment to be made sin for us. Again, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Again, Jesus took off that seamless robe so that we could put on the robe of the righteousness of God. And we ought to be thankful for that this morning, that Jesus Christ made that possible for us. The Bible says we're healed by His stripes. God did turn His face from His Son so that He could look with loving favor on us. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but we can be justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And I am righteous today because of Christ Jesus. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. The Bible says in Isaiah 61 and verse 10, The redeemed of the Lord say, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself uh, with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. You see, because Jesus Christ took off that, that seamless robe to die on that cross for me so that I can put it on, now the unworthy are made worthy. I was unworthy, but I've been made worthy through what Jesus Christ has done. We clothe ourselves with Him. He's our righteousness. He's our garment of salvation. Wow. We have been counted righteous because of what Jesus Christ did. I think it's so strange, though. Think about this with me. Isn't it strange that those Roman soldiers are the ones who got that robe? The Roman soldiers are the ones who got that robe. Think about these soldiers. Do you all think those soldiers were these kind Gracious, compassionate, loving men. No, I'm going to tell you right now, those Roman soldiers were probably some of the roughest ones around. You talk about being hard. Matter of fact, if they were on the crucifixion detail, you know, they had to be the hardest of the hard. I'm telling you. How in the world can you make a man lay down on a cross, you know, and, and start uh, starting hammering spikes through his hands and his feet and it not bother? You imagine they were probably men that cursed, probably uh, had a short uh, 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 fuse, angry, the drop of a hat, things didn't go right, could swear, probably say things. Uh, there was probably things said around that cross that uh, would make people blush. Rough soldiers, rough and tough men, profane, vulgar, part of the mockers. Think about this. It was those Roman soldiers who had uh, make, made a crown of thorns and placed it on the, on the uh, head of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the soldiers who mocked him. It was the soldiers who spit upon him. It was the soldiers who slapped him. It was the soldiers who plucked out his beard. It was the soldiers who took that crown of thorns and placed it down in his head so that there would be great pain and great blood. It was the soldiers who bowed the knee in mockery. And it was one of those soldiers who got this robe. It was one of those soldiers who got the seamless robe of the Lord Jesus Christ after they gambled for it. Isn't it strange that one of them would get that robe? How strange to me that they would even want it. That they would even want it. Now, I want you to think. The Roman soldiers were, were uh, a part of God's plan in this sense. They were fulfilling prophecy. Remember, they were, uh, uh, they were there to break the legs of, of those that had not died. 
And they came by and broke the legs of the two thieves, but when they got to Jesus, they didn't break his legs. You know why they didn't break his legs? Of course, he was dead, but the reason they didn't break his legs is because that was fulfilling prophecy. One of them then took his spear and, and stuck it in the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do you think he did that? Well, again, he wanted to make sure he was dead, but he also did that because that was a fulfillment of prophecy. There was spiritual significance in what they were doing. Now, did they know that they were doing that? No. Did they know they were also fulfilling prophecy? By one of them getting the seamless robe, by taking the seamless robe and then gambling for it? I, th I think it's strange that other people didn't try to claim the robe. Think about his mother. Remember his mother was at the foot of the cross? You know, a lot of times they will give the effects of, of those who die to the closest family members, right? Mary, the mother of Jesus, didn't get the robe. Maybe the other Marys who loved the Lord and who were there, they didn't get his robe. John, the beloved disciple who was there at the foot of the cross as well, and uh, whom Jesus said, you know, woman, behold thy son, and, and behold thy mother. John, one of the disciples, didn't even get the robe of the Lord Jesus Christ. How about Joseph of Arimathea? You know, he went and begged for the body of Jesus. And, and Pilate said, yeah, you can have uh, his body. Nicodemus and Joseph, who buried the Lord Jesus Christ, they did not ask for that robe. They did not get the robe. Even some of the Jewish leaders, you would think some of the high priests or some of the uh, religious leaders and scribes and Pharisees, they might have asked for it so that they could put it as a trophy. Look what I have. The seamless robe of Christ. Yet they did not get it. The coarsest, vilest sinners did. How strange that God would allow the soldiers to get the robe of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we know God planned it that way hundreds of years before. It was probably the only treasured possession of the Lord. The Lord didn't have a house. Uh, the Lord didn't have any horses or cattle. Didn't have any land. Uh, he owned nothing except this beautiful, Seamless robe. The only treasured possession that Jesus had fell into the hands of some of the men who had spit in his face, who mocked him, who laughed at him, who had pressed the crown of thorns into his head, who had beat him, who had slapped him, who had made him carry that heavy cross, who eventually laid him out on that cross and drove those nails into his hands and feet and then dropped that cross into that hole there on Calvary's hill without even thinking or blinking twice. How strange that they would receive this garment that symbolized the righteousness of Christ. Wouldn't it have been better if somebody else could have got it? No. You see, God planned it that way. For you see those soldiers who did all those things to our Lord, we talked about the Lord and His seamless robe, what it pictured were those soldiers picture the vilest sinners in the world. And really, they picture all of the sinners in the world. You know, we look at ourselves and we say, well, we're good people. I'm not, I may be a little sinner, but I'm not much of a sinner. The Bible says, if you sin in one thing, you're guilty of all. We don't compare ourselves that way. That, that, that's almost like comparing ourselves to, uh, or comparing uh, 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 a bottle of water over here that's completely pure and, and then a bottle of water that's got just a little bit of arsenic in it and say, well, I think I'll drink this because it's just got a little bit in it. Uh, I don't think you'd do that. Just because we got a little bit of sin in our life, uh, uh, that still makes us unholy, unrighteous. It's a picture of all the sinners in the world. And see, when the soldier that won in the contest, the gambling contest, 
when he bore away that beautiful garment, the seamless robe of Christ, God was saying to the world that the vilest sinner who ever lived may come if he will and have the righteousness of Jesus Christ cover all of his sins. It's kind of like the story of the prodigal son. Most of you know that story. This young man went to his daddy one day and he said, Dad, I'm tired of living here. I want to, I'm tired of living under, under your rules, under what you say. I want to live my life the way I want to live it. And so I know you've got some money that you're going to give me one day when you die, but I'd like to go ahead and get my inheritance now so that I can leave and go live it up. And you know what the Bible says. You know the story. He left, and the Bible says he, he lived a life of riotous living. He went out, buddy, and he lived it up. And, 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 and while he had money, he had friends. He'd walk in the bar, and, and he'd say, Yeah, hey, drinks for everybody, home me. Man, he had plenty of friends. One day he woke up, out of money. What was he going to do? A Jewish boy ended up working in a pig pen. That's what he did. Feeding the hogs, living with the hogs. Then one day, he got this idea. He said, you know what? I think I'll just go back to my father. He, uh, the Bible says he came to himself, which is a great, great fault. Anybody that's living away from God, the, they have to come to themselves. You, you cannot go twist their arm. You cannot make them do it. They have to come to themselves. He came to himself. He repented of his sin. He said, I'm going to go back to my dad. and said, Dad, I'll just be one of your hired servants. And you know the story where the dad was looking down the road and he saw something coming. He said, that kind of looks like my son. He's not quite the same because he, he don't look quite the same. What sinful living had done to him. But as he got closer and closer, he saw that it was his son. And he ran, the Bible says, he ran to meet him and he kissed him. And he said, I want you to kill the fatted calf. We're going to do this. He said, bring a ring. Put a ring on him. But what else did he tell him? What else did he tell the servants to bring? Bring a robe. Bring a robe. That's what he said. A robe. You know what that robe symbolized? Again, it symbolized that he was forgiven and that he was, again, his son. Forgiven. Forgiven of his sin. See, the Lord Jesus Christ gave up his seamless, seamless robe to, the, to, to a sinner to picture for us that he took that off so that we can put it on. He can put it on us, this righteousness that only he can give us today. You remember the elder brother in the story of the prodigal son said, well, he doesn't deserve that beautiful robe. He doesn't deserve all this that you're doing. I'm going to tell you, none of us deserve the robe the Lord Jesus Christ gives to us. But when it comes to salvation, praise God, we don't get what we deserve. We get His grace. Jesus got what we deserved, and now we get what He deserved. Jesus will today put on you a robe of righteousness, and then the Bible talks about that as justification, and God will then look at you just as if you'd never sinned. Wow. How awesome is that? The robe, the robe. His own purity and holiness, if you'll trust him, will be given to you in this robe of righteousness. Then one day, I'm going to be welcomed in heaven because I got his robe on. Hallelujah. Would you bow your heads with me? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.